Okay. So it's hard to follow such a great uh, uh, live video as the BTV. Like, it's really an amazing thing to see and hard to feel like you've got something as exciting to show afterwards. Thanks for joining me here today. Today, you probably don't know who I am and why I'm yammering on in your camera a little bit nervously because I'm just getting started <laughs> to work through my flow. Thanks for um, being patient with that. My name is Tina Burry and I have a company called Kinship Handwork in Northern Michigan. And I teach people how to sew clothes that they love. And part of sewing clothes that you love for me is the sustainability aspect that comes with also mending clothes that you love. So today we're gonna to talk about visible mending. But before we do that, I wanna thank both Cross Hatch and Title Track for letting me come on and take up your morning this morning with some visible mending. And I also wanna say that you can donate down in the comments. There's a link, or there will be a link to donate to both Cross Hatch and Title Track. So feel free to do that for this really amazing programming that they put together. And then on the second note, along those lines is eventually there'll also be a post, a link rather, to um, my website where you can get a little PDF called Visible Mending that will go through my resources that I use, the different techniques I like to use for mending, and a little pouch project that you can make, as well as um, just some other thoughts on mending. So you can access both of those in the comments here before too long. So feel free to do that as well. So I want to say um, a little bit about who I am so you know who you might be hanging out with for the next hour and a half or so. Again, I have a small business in Northern Michigan teaching people how to sew clothes that they love. I have been sewing clothes for probably about 13 years because I like to take my life into my own hands, right? I like to be able to find things that I love to wear, things that I love to put on my body that fit my body perfectly with my own two hands. So maybe 13 years ago, I started sewing dresses and I never ever looked back, right? My grandmother was a seamstress, but when she passed away when I was 17, I had not taken the time to learn from her and I always wished I had. So sewing clothing gave me a, an ability to clothe my body at whatever size it was perfectly as it is. And it gave me the ability to connect with my grandma. And it gave me the ability to work with my hands, right? Like there's just something magical about making a thing with your own two hands and knowing its whole process, its whole line, for the most part, of production, right? Like I tend to buy organic cotton, so I know at least what how it's been produced. And I make it by hand, so I know like that whole process it goes through. And I'm able to do it slowly and with intention. And then that in itself just aids its sustainability. So you know, I'm diverging here, but that's kind of my philosophy and what I stand for and what I'm about. Um, my website's kinshiphandwork.com if you want to see any of it. Today we're going to talk about visible mending and you might be saying to yourself, what on earth is visible mending? What does that mean? Generally speaking, you're thinking that if you're going to mend something, you want it to be nearly invisible, right? You want it to disappear into the garment. And that certainly is a very valid way to go when you're mending your clothing. Visible mending is about taking really beautiful stitches, typically a sashiko stitch or a running stitch, like you would use for quilting, and putting that into your garment to create a patch and to create more stability for fabric that might be wearing, but also to add beauty to your fabric. So I'm gonna show you a couple of examples that I have that are my sons, because they're easier to hold up in front of this little screen. I should say too, before I do that, if you're watching this, let me know in the comments if you've ever mended a garment, whether that's stitched up the seam or made a crazy scar looking fix on a gash or whatever that might be. Throw that in the comments. Let me know you're out there listening. And I would love to hear that from you. So go ahead and do that and I will show you my examples. So this is, these are some pants that were my son's, he's four. And you can see this patch here that I have. This is visible mending. So these are just basic running stitches that I've used to secure my patch, which is here at the knee, 
and also just to add some interest in something that I think is pretty beautiful to the garment. And so this patch is on the inside and I'm going to go through all of this here in a minute. I'm just showing you some examples right now. And then this patch is on the outside. And if you look really closely, I'm not sure if you can see that, you can see my stitches. And on this one, the stitches I chose to kind of blend into the garment and not be contrasting. So that was more of, um, more of a textural thing and less of a contrasting thing. And then I also have another one of my little fellas. Not to worry, he's not pantless. These no longer fit. Here's a patch that I did on this knee. And you can see that white box that's going around the hole. That is holding the patch down on the inside. And I've chosen a little contrasting color to pop out of there. And then you can see the stitches I did just for fun. And then this one here is another exterior patch that I did, but with contrasting thread. Another one I would love to show you is one I've been working on for a friend of mine. And this one had a lot of repairs. And I want to show you some of the repairs that I did and talk briefly about them. And then we'll get into the all the specifics. Hopefully, if you're with us today, you might you might have been coming from the SkillSwap website and you might know to bring a needle and thread. If not, run and grab some because we can work through some of these stitches together and you can get a feel for how it goes, which I think is a great way to really feel, um, to really and uh, to really absorb what you're learning is when you can actually get your hands on it. So I would love it if you've got the ability to grab a needle, grab some thread, grab some fabric, and we'll work through the stitches together. Hi, Norma. It's great to see that you've mended your garments. I love that. Okay, so this is when, trying to get back here far enough, that I have patched the knee. This is a, a woman's adult pant. And I want to show you this one is that this one's a little bit different because these pants stretch. So the stitches and the patch that I use have to stretch as well. So I've used a cross stitch rather than a running stitch as it's going around the body because these pants stretch over the legs rather than just laying loosely on them. And then she had some tear outs in the back pocket area. Let me get this over here. Sorry about that. And you can see I've just reinforced, <laughs> I've just reinforced that hole that was here with some a patch behind and some stitches there. So you can see that. And then I'm sure a lot of you can relate to this. She had some wear on the inner thigh area. And so I took that and I added a patch. And these I'm actually in a perfect world, I probably would have used a thread that was a little bit less contrasting, so it, it became more invisible and less visible. But I'm just reinforcing it with running stitches there. And we'll revisit those as we get going. Kelly, that's great. Mending a shoulder bag. I love it. Thanks for being here. I enjoy that you guys are there. and. It sounds like Norma made Brad's Halloween costume. It was very cool. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about tools for visible mending. And again, if you want to get the PDF, it's free for this little series, this little talk I'm doing. Looks like this. And you can get that in a link in the comments. And then, um, and then you'll have all this information here too. So tools that you'll want. You'll want, obviously, a hand sewing needle. I generally will use an embroidery needle, although a sashiko, and that's S-A-S-H-I-K-O, a sashiko needle, is um, a great way to go, too. It's a needle that's longer and has a little bit larger of an eye, so you can really build your stitches up on your needle, and I'll show you that, too. But I use um, John James is my favorite brand, and I use this embroidery needle. And I generally want something that doesn't have a huge eye. And these ones have an elongated needle head or needle eye, but not particularly wide because you want it to go through your garment pretty smoothly and not get caught up. You also need it to be stout enough to go through, say you're going to mend denim, you want it to be stout enough to go through your denim. All right. So you'll need a needle. 
You'll also need some sort of thread to mend your clothing with. I like to use Sashiko thread. And Sashiko, I'm not going to get into that too far here, but I'll do a little side note here. Sashiko is a Japanese type of stitching, really, where they're using um, running stitches to create pattern. I don't have a great example for you, but if you look up Sashiko, you'll see lots of examples of it. But they're using running stitches to make beautiful patterns, kind of like embroidery, but only using the running stitch. And a lot of people that are into the visible mending movement, which is kind of a movement now, um, use Sashiko stick stitches to create that those beautiful stitches on their garment because you're using just a simple running stitch, with, which any of us can really do. And it just creates such beauty with this sort of rhythmic stitch. So check out Sashiko if you want. But I like to use Sashiko thread. And I have a resource in this little PDF that tells you where I get mine, but you can just Google it too. Probably you won't find it locally, unfortunately. So it looks like this, this thread here. It comes in a little mini skein. And I'll show you in a minute how to braid it so that you're not um, completely frustrating yourself with a big rat's nest of thread, which is what often happens if you don't very carefully manage your thread. So that's the kind of thread I use. And I use that kind of thread for a particular reason. Ultimately, you want your thread and your fabric to match in content. So if you're going to patch up some denim, denim is made out of cotton, generally speaking. So you want a cotton to match with your cotton denim. And the reason that you want them to match is you want them to wear at the same rate. If you use the polyester thread, like a thick polyester thread on, on your denim, one, you're going to feel it on your skin and it might feel a little uncomfortable. But two, that polyester thread's going to stick around for pretty much forever. <laughs> and the cotton of your denim is going to wear away. And so they don't have the same strength and they don't have the same wearability. And so they become incompatible as a mend. So then the next thing I want to talk about is patches are patches and patches it's the same kind of thing this is a little linen piece of fabric which you can see its thickness perhaps on the screen and this is a little bit of wool and you can see this is a little bit of an old bed sheet <laughs> and then here's a thicker piece of wool so for my denim if I'm not going to use a denim patch to fix my jeans I'm going to want something that's a similar thickness that has a similar weight and hopefully a similar composition or fiber, right? So it doesn't really matter too much if I'm using a wool with a cotton, that's okay, as long as they have the same kind of weight to them. So you wanna, you wanna match those together. You wanna match your patch to your fabric. You don't want a patch made out of polyester, for, like for example, and use it on a cotton pair of jeans. It just won't wear the same and it may feel odd to you. So that's why, long story short, why I use a cotton Sashiko thread. I wouldn't use something like an embroidery thread or just a machine sewing thread because, so the embroidery thread isn't gonna last long enough. It's a really thin thread that is not um, plied together. It's all separate, so I wouldn't use the embroidery thread for that reason. It, it would wear really quickly. And again, I wouldn't use the machine sewing thread because one, it's very thin, and two, it's generally made of polyester and it's gonna wear at a different rate. So this is what I like to use. And if I'm not using my Sashiko thread, I might use a mercanized cotton crochet thread. You probably have seen them. They come in like a little ball and you would use them to make lace and things like that. So if you look at your local fabric store, they might have the mercanized cotton there that you could use. So those are some of the pieces I like to use. And I wanted to show you too. The other day I was doing some natural dyeing and I natural dyed with some onion skins which creates this really beautiful yellow. So I threw in a skein of my Sashiko thread and I came out with this really vibrant yellow color from my discarded onion skins, which is just so much fun. And so this would be a really fun one to use as well on my patches. Traditionally speaking, um, Sashiko stitching is done with a white thread on indigo denim. That's the tradition of it. 
and that's what you're going to find most is a white cell shape of thread but you can find some that are made of like that are various colors of indigo or you can even find some that are different colors but white is your most common because it has that high contrast and that just contributes to the look of it so something like this Does anyone have any questions so far about the materials that you'll use for mending your clothing? All right. I just want to re-emphasize that um, there are links in the comments where you can donate to both Crosshatch and Title Track, who are providing all this great programming for us. And also, if you want the PDF with my resources and how to go about visible mending outside of this video, and also I think I'll be able to do a replay of the video on it too. I'm not entirely certain on that, so I don't want to sell that too much. But um, check out the link that is there for Hinge of Handwork, and that will be where the PDF is. Okay. I sometimes also will use a thimble. Actually, I don't really use a thimble. thimble. But a lot of people do, and I, it's one of those things that I want to do. <laughs> I feel like I should be using a thimble because real sewists use a th thimble. Um, but, you know, no shame. If we don't use a thimble, that's okay. But I want to show you a few variations of thimbles just in case you want to use a thimble. Because sometimes when you're mending denim and you have two layers of denim or some other thicker fabric and you're stitching with your big needle and your thick thread, um, it can be hard to get it to go through your fabric. So a thimble can be really helpful in pushing the needle. And that's how you use a thimble. You use it to push the needle. So here I have a traditional metal thimble. And you see like you put it on the middle finger of your dominant hand and you would push the needle through as you get going. And I'm gonna demonstrate these stitches and I'll show you that then. I also have, because I've been searching for the right thimble that I would want to use, I also have a little leather thimble that also would go on that same finger and it would be, again, just to push the needle through. A little more flexible, a little more breathable, that kind of thing. And then I have one that looks like this, sort of like a band-aid, if you will. And it would go right here on your hands and it would also push the needle through as you're sewing. I also like to use Taylor's chalk which looks like this. It's just a little wafer of chalk. I think it has a little wax in it as well. And I use it with a ruler to sketch out my stitches if I want them to have a little, per little more perfection and a little less freeform. I often go freeform because that's really my style. But if you want to have some, some more perfect lines and a little more, um, I don't know, there can be something very pleasing about having things be very even and very straight. Then use Taylor's chalk and a ruler. Whatever ruler you have will work. So I would just, I'll show you here in a minute. I would just be on, I imagine this is my garment. I would just make myself some lines to follow as I'm stitching. Or I might make a line around the exterior of my patch if it's on the inside of my garment and then use my chalk to line that and stitch along my, my chalk line. So I like both of those things too. And I use this in all of my garment making. So I use Taylor's chalk all the time. And I also love my big ruler. Okay. So, so what I'm gonna be working on here in our time together is a little pouch that I like to make with my classes when I teach this in person, out in the wind and the sun and the rain and all of these things. I like to make a little pouch because I like you to have something small. This is the exterior of the pouch. I like you to have something small to work on so that you can get used to the stitches and you can get used to patching something. But you could go right to a garment if that's what you have too. But if you don't, this is a great way to start. And then, because I like to make things that have utility, and that I can put into my life and not have is just, um, there's nothing wrong with just creating samples, but I like to do something with them. So this is my way of doing something with it. So in that little PDF, there's instructions for how to cut these pieces up. But today I'm going to patch this hole. And you can imagine this was in any garment that I might have, it could be on the shoulder or 
could be on your knee or it could be anywhere, right? So I'm gonna patch that little hole. And then um, I probably won't get to sewing up the pouch. But again, if you wanna do the pouch, I'm showing you this, like you know what this is. This is the lining of the pouch that would be on the inside of it. So if you want to do, um, if you want to do the whole pouch again, grab that PDF and you can do that. But I'm going to show you today how this works. Do we have any questions yet about any of the tools I've used about the saw shaker thread? Um, any questions about needles? Anything coming up for anyone? Okay, we will move on. Hold on one moment. Bear with me. Okay. Can somebody shoot me a comment? I just had a no notice on my phone that I was offline and it made me feel a little nervous. So if someone can just do a quick comment in the comments just to give me a little peace of mind, I would appreciate that. go sorry about that folks so I have my two different devices set up because I wanted this to be as seamless as possible <laughs> and my computer is not showing any comments but when I just updated my phone it did so thank you again for anybody who commented for me um, I see somebody asked how do I spell that I'm guessing they meant Sashiko I'll go through and say that again it's s-a-s-h-i-k-o and then um, let me look and see what else we have here. Looks like Phyllis does a lot of mending of socks and jeans. We're not going to talk about darning today, which is a different kind of thing as far as what you would do with a knitted garment, um, like a sweater or something. Is you would darn that, which is a different process. It's not what we'll work on today, but I do love the idea of that. And then, all right, looks like we're good. Oh, and I see a question from Brad. Can you turn it inside out to show the other side? Yes, I can do that. Let me do that real quick before we move on. Now we're cooking with gas. All right, so here's the up pocket rip out. And here's the inside. You can see I just put a little patch on it. I didn't finish the edges or anything else. I just put a little patch on it so I could reinforce it. And you can see it had not completely worn through on the front, but it was very thin. I'm guessing you can see that in here. So that's how I would have done that. And this one you see I've not done yet. And again, it's not a complete hole yet. But it's kind of like the saying that your grandmother or mom might have said, or maybe your dad. Um, a stitch in time saves nine. And it's one of these where this is much easier to fix. It's first just quicker and faster than a big gaping hole is. So the faster you can mend something, the better um, for you and also for the garment and its longevity. Okay, let me see what else we have here. Great. I <laughs> like Norma says, thanks for the honesty about the thimble. I've had a hard time using one too. I completely get it. and it's like I get it it's I have this tiny bit of guilt or shame around it and we should not Norma we should not be ashamed that we don't use a thimble if we get holes in our fingers it's our own darn fault okay so any other questions let me know I think I now can see the comments a little easier and can assist you that way I'd love to this to be as interactive as possible so that's what I love to do so I'm going to show you how to handle this saw shaker thread. Bear with me a moment so I can give you some space. All right. So typically, I'm actually going to bring the camera down to my slightly messy table so you can see this more easily. So I would open up my saw shaker 
skein and sometimes embroidery thread comes like this too or a mechanized cotton does as well so you might come across this in different ways and i'm going to kind of tease it apart right because if you don't tease it apart you're very likely to end up with a big mess and this happens every time i teach a class somebody has some sort of thread failure going on so give me a minute to figure out why i've got that piece over there and somewhere on the skein, there will be a little knot. So you can see that there. So that will help you keep it all together too. This is easiest if you have somebody to help you. And I would then have another person hold up their finger for you and put this on their finger and you hold it taut with your other hands, other hand, cut it at the knot and then loosely braid it down so that it looks like this. And you want it to be loose because you want it to come, you want to be able to pull a thread out of that loop, but you don't want it to come unbraided, right? Because you want it to stay there so that you can use it for how you need to use it. So I'm going to grab one of these loops. I'm not going to show you completely on this because I don't have another finger here to hold it. But if I am all by myself and I don't have any way to do it, just to give you some, a pointer for this, I might find anything that's standing, like a broomstick or a doorknob or something that you can just loop it onto and then cut it and loosely braid it. Okay. Bear with me. All right. So then once you've braided it loosely again, you want it to be, you're not like looking to win any braiding awards with this. You want it to be loose, slightly messy. So what you would then do is come to the loop, grab one, and I kind of grab a hold of the rest of it with my hand, not tightly, but sort of firmly right here at this edge. And I pull it up and you see it's like bunching up underneath my hand. And I pull it up and all the way through. And then this goes back to being your little braided piece. And now you have a really nice length. <laughs> there we go. Now you have a really nice length of thread to work with. One that isn't going to be um, too long. So let's talk about that for a minute. Generally speaking, you want, generally speaking, you want your thread to be about your elbow, the length of your elbow to your finger. Maybe over there as you can see. So finger to elbow is generally speaking how long you want your thread to be. Any longer it, it might tangle up on you, it's very likely to tangle up on you. Um, any shorter and you're just going to be frustrated with how many times you have to re-thread your needle. So you want it to be about that long, which is about what this ends up being, right? It's doubled over, which is how I'm going to use it. I'm going to use it doubled over. And it's about elbow length for me. So then, I like to kind of level up my thread a little bit. So I'm just taking my fingers and I'm running my fingers through my thread. And I'm saying things like, you are going to make the most beautiful mend ever. You are such a lovely thread. We're going to have a lovely time together. Maybe it should be more manly. We're going to be like, you are some tough thread. You are going to make a nice, tough mend. Not that, you know, you take this however you want. You can say whatever loving thing you want to say to your thread so that it creates the kind of patch and mend that you want it to create. But doing this actually accomplishes, other than the energetic feel good, it accomplishes a couple of things. It puts your mattress oils from your skin into the thread. And because thread is plied together, it sort of works out the extra twists in the ply so that when you're sewing, it has less of an opportunity to twist up a knot on you. So it's one of the frustrations with hand sewing is that it twists up a knot on you. So, you want to just work it out, I don't know, five or six times, as many times as you need to. It actually is sort of meditative, so you're just working it through. Then I always start with a fresh cut on my end when I thread the needle. And so I like to do it at a bit of an angle, you can see that. And I usually, you know, this is not very COVID, um, friendly so don't share your thread maybe with a friend but I usually use a little bit of saliva to really smooth it down because this is kind of thick thread 
to go through your needle. And you want to use the needle again, just to reemphasize. You want your needle to be only as big as you need it to be. You don't want it to be bigger than you need because it could leave big holes. I'm not talking like baseball size holes, but it could leave like little holes in your garment that you might not want. So you want to use only as big as you need. So I have just a little embroidery needle here. I'm pinching it. I don't know if you can see this super tiny into my fingers. And now I'm going to take the needle and I'm going to wiggle it over that hole. And because I'm on television, it's like television because I'm on Facebook. It's like, um, no, this isn't going to work for you. All right. And I'm going to wiggle it over. And then for me, I end up getting just a tiny, tiny bit. Can you see that? I don't know if you can see that. And I grab it, pinch it down, and I pull it through. And there it is. And so for this one, I'm going to double it up, like I mentioned, because I'm looking for some contrast in my, in my um, mint. And then I'm going to take it, and I'll do just a couple more pulls on it to make sure that it's they're working well together and they're all ready to go. Then I bring it down and I'm going to double knot the scent. And I just literally double knot it just like that. That's one knot. And it creates kind of a big knot. Some people just use a back stitch. I've never done that, um, but I know that it's possible. And I know that a lot of people do it and they have tons of success. I have this little bit of fear that if I don't double knot it, it's not going to stay strong, and so I don't do that. But I want you to pray. I want you to try it if it feels right to you. So that's how I get my thread in my needle already. And I'm going to set that aside. Do we have any question, questions up to this point? Judy, I bet you do a lot of patches and zigzag. Thanks for sharing your comments. All right. Feel free to pop any questions you might have into the comments. I would love to be able to answer them in, in real time if you have them. So, Okay, so I have this hole in my pants, we'll say, this little hole here. I've Obviously, I've been like maybe jumping a fence and um, I hit a no nail and it ripped my pants. So that's what we have on it because there's no there's no fraying or wear around the hole right so this is probably a tear and less of a, of a um, wear away so some of the things that you might want to do with this is you have to make some choices you might want to trim all these extra things all these extra <laughs> things being threads away you might want to trim this flap away you might want to fold it down and stitch it down that could look kind of fun um it all kind of depends on where your hole is on your garment and how it's going to wear. Like if this was say your elbow, folding that down might feel uncomfortable when you're resting your elbow on the table even though your mom told you not to. So think that through before you patch this. How do you want that to be? Some people love this frayed little edgy look and that's totally cool. Some people want it to look much neater. So you could also cut out your whole hole. And why don't I do that this time? So I'm going to use my sweet little scissors. I'm going to put you back down here on the messy table. I'm trying to be careful so that you don't see too much of the mess and just a little bit of the mess. All right, so I'm going to, I'm actually just going to cut out my little flap. And I'm going to cut all the way around into the solid fabric with my sweet little scissors. Okay, so I've cut out my hole. And when I patch it, and again, I'm gonna choose a patch that, oh, sorry, I don't know if you can see that. Can you see that? I guess you can. <laughs> this is so much fun. Um, truly it is. So I'm going to take my edge here and I'm going to fold it in towards the back of my garment and stitch it down that way. So I'm gonna choose a patch material I'm going to use this wool that I have here. And so I want my patch material to be a half an inch at least larger than the hole in my garment. So I don't know if you can see that hole very well in that lightness. Let me do this so you can see it. See that hole? 
I want my patch to be a half an inch larger on all sides than this wool. If this were also worn away further out, I want a bigger patch to, I want my patch to be as large as my worn fabric or my hole is by an additional half inch. So if you've got, if it was worn all the way out here, I want my patch to be at least this big so that I'm solidly putting my patch into stable, strong fabric so that I'm not, um, well, you just simply don't want your patch to be in something that's going to tear away more easily because you're going to be patching it again sooner than you want to. So I'm going to come here and I'm going to say, there's my hole. I've got plenty of room around. And just for fun, I'll show you how I would mark it with my chalk. I'm going to do a little square patch for this little round hole. And I'm going to do it on the inside because that's really my favorite way to do them, honestly. I might not cut out my patches and things with my tiny little cute snips, but you know, here I am. So now that I have a patch, I have a few choices here. There are so many choices. This is definitely a choose your own adventure kind of thing. Now that I have my patch, I can either take my garment, turn it inside out, put it over it, and just put some pins on it so that I can mark it on the other side and start stitching it on. Or I can take this and I can fold over my edges and iron it if I wanted it to have a very clean inside. And again, like I mentioned, I'm going to take these and I'm going to roll these to the inside, that edge just a little bit. I'm going to do that while I'm sewing it so that it um, is a little more simple. So I'm not going to finish my edge, but you could. You could also use your pinking shears. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but they're just shears that create a little zigzag on your fabric so that it doesn't fray as much. Or you could um, leave it like it is or fold it over, whichever feels good. So I'm going to put mine like this. I need to bring it around. And now with my hands, I can feel, and I'm going to make sure that this positioned how I want it. I can feel where my patch is. So I'm going to take my ruler and my fingers, and I'm going to line it up so that, and I'm going to bring it in just a little bit so that I know if I'm going to stitch on this edge, I'm actually catching the, the patch fabric and not just, um, And not just sewing through the jeans. And then I come over here and I'm going to find my patch line over here. So the beauty of the chalk pad, the tailor's chalk, is that it will, it'll both rub out and it will wash out. It's always advantageous. So you have a really beautiful fabric that you love very much. Maybe it's a silk fabric or something else like that. It's always a good idea to test it in a little area that you aren't going to see and then try to rub it out or rinse it out and make sure it comes out because generally speaking, I've never had an issue with Taylor's chalk, but that's just a good rule of thumb. Okay, then I'm gonna come over here, and again, I'm gonna feel my edge and come in. I'm gonna give myself a little line. And then we come up here, and I know where my edge is there. And do that. Okay. And then I might use some straight pins and come through and just do a couple of little pins just to make sure everything stays where I want it to stay. And I just come through, poke it through, and back up. I'm sure you probably know how to do that, but yes, here you go. So the first thing I would do is I would secure this patch down. The second thing is I would finish this hole, and then I would add any decorative stitches I wanted to use. So I have my thread here that I'm going to use. I'm going to use this yellow thread. I'm going to come up from behind, so I'm going to come up from the underneath, and I'm going to come up just in a corner. And I'm going to do a running stitch. And generally speaking, you want your running stitch to be about a quarter of an inch, an eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch long, so that um, too small and it might pull through your garment, too large and it might catch on everything and drive you crazy. And then you'll just have to repair things again. So I like to just poke it through, feel it with my fingers and bring it back up. Poke it through, feel it with my fingers and bring it back up. And I'm being very careful not to jab that underneath my thumbnail. And then I have built, you know, two or three stitches onto this, and I'm going to pull it through. And I'm going to pull it through. And I'm going to then organize any. I've got a little twisting going on. 
So I'm going to organize this so that it's nice and straight. So that would be my beginning. I'll do a few more of those and then I'll show you what it looks like if you do a stab stitch instead. So I, this is my favorite way to do a running stitch because you can really build up the needles. Excuse me, you can really build up the thread on your needle and not, um, and not, it's just faster. It's faster, a little bit less wear and tear. So I think I might have mentioned earlier, maybe I didn't, but this happens to me all the time. You see how my thread has gotten caught on my needle here? That happens all the time. And it's something that you want to just kind of manage as best you can. But my thread is having a little trouble coming through effortlessly, even though we loved it up as much as we did. And that's just the nature of this. If you had not loved it up, it probably would be much worse. So I'm just kind of straightening it out and getting it through. And there I am. And you don't have to use your thread doubled up. I just like to, but you might prefer not to. So then I'm going to keep going. I'll do the stab me method now. So this is building it up on your needle. Stabbing it would be to literally go all the way through, come in from the other side, and pull it through. I have a little bit of trouble going on. So I'm going to just kind of, I'm going to give it a little more love on it to see if I can get whatever that kink is out that is causing trouble. And here we are again, a little bit. I think it's right in there. So I'm going to pull it through. All right, so then with a stab stitch, you again would just come up from underneath. And then when you're up, you're just going to go down where you want it to go next. There's a little more precision with a stab stitch than there is with building up your stitches on your needle. Um, but I still, again, I'm, I'm not a big perfectionist and I like the efficiency that I get with building up your stitches on your needle, like so. And then pulling it through. You see, I've worked that kink out for the most part. And I'm gonna go all the way around just like that. And while I do that, does anyone have any questions for me as you're watching? Anything coming up for anyone? Anyone have a funny mending story they want to share? Anything that happened that they're like, I don't know, might be entertaining. Oh, I just poked myself in the thumb. This is what happens when you're trying to watch the comments or maybe your favorite TV show while you were stitching. It's a hazard of the work. All right. So as I'm stitching this, I want to again reemphasize that if you are inclined, there is a link in the comments early on to be able to donate to both Crosshatch and Tidal Track because they've been putting on this really lovely programming for all of us to entertain our Saturdays and help us feel more connected and part of community, which is such a lovely thing. So that link is there. And if you are just catching this, we're doing a little bit of visible mending, which means we're fixing our clothing that has a hole or worn spot with a patch and stitches that are visible and beautiful. And just add a little bit of pizzazz to our clothing, a little bit of style, a little bit of uniqueness, a little bit of soul, if you will. Um, I'm Tina and I have a business in Northern Michigan called Kinship Handwork where I teach people to sew clothing that they love because I find sewing my own clothing to be satisfying on a million levels. I find it to be satisfying for just a sense of empowerment. I find it satisfying for a sense of body love. I get to just clothe the body I have exactly as it is. And I find it to be something I can do in community, which is such a lovely thing. See, I just caught my needle again. <laughs> you can see I'm just like kind of working out my stitches as I go. Okay, you're almost to this. Did anybody grab this? Any questions coming up? All right. I want to show you when I get to the end how I knot it off because it's um, my favorite way to finish it off. And again, you could do a back stitch. Um, I just get nervous that it's not not secure enough to 
hold your garment, but I know a lot of people who use it with success and with love. And so I don't want to stop you from doing that if that's your favorite way to secure your thread to your garment or to your project. Um, but that's why I don't. It's more just, uh, you know, it's probably even more just habit, right? Like we all get into our own habits with our projects and we don't, um, we don't always, we don't always like to shift. Okay, so I've secured my patch to the exterior, or excuse me, to the interior of my pair of pants. We're assuming these are some pants. So I've secured my patch. I'm going to turn it this way, meaning inside out. <laughs> and I'm going to put a, a knot right here taut to the fabric. So how I do that, and I'm hoping I can get any closer. I see my kombucha here in the corner. A little home brewed kombucha that I been, have here for company. Okay, I take my, I just feel like you need to be closer. This works best on a hard surface though. So I take my fingers on the thread as it's coming out of my garment and I put a little tension on it and I don't let up on that tension. Then I take my needle and I go under that tense up thread and I pull it through until it gets smaller and then I put my finger on it and I continue just kidding and then I continue to pull it through and that puts a knot right on the fabric not out at all just completely right on it and you don't want your your stitches to be like as taut as possible because you do want your garment to be able to move a little bit, even though this is a garment that doesn't have natural stretch to it, you want it to be able to move with your body the little bit that it does have. And I always do a double knot, so I'm going to do it again. And if anybody wants that re-demonstrated after I've done this, please tell me. So I'm holding this, this one here, come, the thread coming out of the fabric taut, and coming underneath it with a needle, creating a loop, and then I'm going to keep my tension on this as I pull it through. Let's try to grab my other knot too. And then I'm going to put my finger on it and pull it all the way through. And then I like to leave about a half inch tail like so. And that way um, when you're wash laundering up your garment, it's going to wear this down a little bit. Your knot might shift a little bit. You want to have a little room for that to move just in case you know, if there is wear from the laundry or there is, um, your knot does loosen up a little bit. You want to be able to make sure that that's going to stay nice and sturdy for you. Okay. So my patch is secure, but I haven't handled my hole yet. And so let's go to that. And I'm going to take my pins out because I find them to be so much frustrating, but they're helpful at the very beginning. Bear with me just a minute. Oh. So I'm seeing some new, um, I'm seeing some new questions. Let me go back through and see what I can answer here. Meadow, this is great trick with the braiding. Thanks, Meadow. That's a nice way. Let me show you my face on this. These questions. That's a nice way to not have your thread all tangled. Um, it's kind of magical, actually. It just feels like, I don't know. I don't know why this little braided skein of thread is so magical, but it is. And then, so Phyllis asked me, do you felt your wool first? I don't felt the wool first. You could. You certainly could. You don't necessarily want it to end up really, really thick, though, compared to your garment, unless you have a really, really thick garment. Again, you want those to match. You want your garment your patch and your thread to match in a certain way. Um, Norma says that <laughs> traveling across the country in the late 60s, my canvas car top carrier started to rip and I tried to repair it with diapers and pins. <laughs> Didn't really work, she said. That's really funny. I like that. Thanks for sharing. And Judy says that there's some nice running water sounds in the background. I don't live near running water, so I'm not really sure what that is. Um, but I'm glad that it sounds delightful. Thanks for the comments. I love them. Keep them coming. Okay. So now we've got this little patch. This might be easier for you to see there. 
So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to stitch around this hole with a little, um, I think I'll use a parallel stitch and I'll show you what that looks like. And I'm going to tuck the edge that I've cut of that hole inside as I do it. And then I'll show you just a couple of fun stitches on this patch, but I want to then move to talking about patching something that has stretch. Because generally speaking, nowadays, I just love being able to use those phrases, nowadays, jeans have some a spandex in them so that they stretch around our bodies. And if you're going to, to patch anything with the spandex or that stretches, you need both a patch that stretches and a stitch that stretches. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But before we do, I'll show you how I finish this patch. All right, let me bring you back down. Can somebody comment like, can you see fairly well when I have this down on the patch itself? I'd love to be able to adjust it if for some reason it's not showing up how I want it to be. So let me know in the comments if that feels good. I'm going to bring you down though. Okay. So I'm going to take my thread and again, I'm going to show you how I did this. I'm going to grab a loop out. I'm going to create a little bit of a pressure here with my fingers and kind of cup the braid with the rest of my fingers. I'm going to pull it through and it's going to bunch up just like that. And you might think, oh, I'm doing it wrong. Something's wrong. You are not. This is perfect. So I'm going to keep going all the way through. And then you've got your braid that you can set aside. And I have my, my thread again because I need to, this is too small to really get started with. It's not really. If you are going to be really economical, you might want to use this. That's a great thing to use up. But I don't want to thread my needle a million times here on TV because it's a lot of fun. TV. I keep calling it TV. Isn't that funny? Apparently, I'm like Julia Child with her um, cooking shows or something. All right, I'm going to cut it at an angle. I'm going to wet my fingers and kind of twist it a little bit so that I get a nice, neat edge here and bring it down right down to my fingertips. And if you can see it in there, get it right in there. And I take my needle and I wiggle the eye right over it until it starts to come out. You can see that. It's just barely coming out. Then I trap it with my finger. I grab it with the other one, with my nail generally, and I pull it through. So this one, just to show you the difference, I'm not going to um, double up. I'm just going to have it be double a portion of the way as though you're, as you're probably used to doing. But I am going to spend the time to love up my thread. You're going to make a beautiful patch. It's going to be strong. It's going to be capable. You're going to adorn my pouch and I'm going to run my fingers over you every time I see you in glee. And we're going to have a lovely time together. Then I'm going to take my ends and I'm going to double knot it. And I just do it this, this way. I've had people, students in my classes, show me really fancy ways that their grandma showed them, but I can't seem to remember them. I don't know if it's an old dog, new trick kind of thing, or what. That one came out for some reason. So here I am. Let me see. All right, so here I am, got my thread. I'm gonna come in from the, from underneath, from the wrong side to the right side. And I'm gonna go maybe an eighth of an inch into the denim away from the hole. And I'm going to bring my thread up. Then I'm going to once you get this started, it'll be easier. I'm physically going to just bring my edge over and under so that it has a neat edge. And I'm going to bring my, I'm going to do the stab stitch to get it started. I'm going to bring my needle down right at the edge, but into only the patch so that I can bring, I have my stitch looking like that. Then I'm going to come up about an eighth of an inch away from that that, that stitch. And I'm coming up through the denim and the patch. I'm folding under my patch. And I'm going to bring my needle down right at the edge between the patch 
and the opening of my my holder and I'll bring it down so I'm going to do that all the way around as I get going and then I'll again I'll come up about an eighth of an inch from my previous stitch I'll fold it under and I'll go down right at that edge and bring it down and if you know any fancier stitches that you like like let's say you wanted to do um, a buttonhole stitch here you could definitely do that or a blanket stitch that's often called a blanket stitch you could do that here on this edge that would look really fun so I'm gonna come up I am going to fold under my hole and go down into the catch so again, just to reemphasize, if I use the fabric here for this patch, something like, let's say, my fun but very thin piece of sheeting, it would wear through very quickly. And I'd be very frustrated because I would then need to patch my patch again. So now I'm going to show you a way to simplify this. I've been showing you this stab stitch. So you come up, right? And if you wanted to do this, I'm going to turn it a little bit so that I can get to it better. I'm going to fold under my edge and I can go down in the same area that I was and then just turn my needle and come through where I would have come up. And then that is a little faster, especially when you're working with little bitty jeans like your kids jeans or something like that, which are a little harder to get your hand into and work effectively with this is an easier way to do those and so then I'm going to come over grab my fold again I'm going to go down right at the edge and up on the exterior there I'm going to grab my fabric as I go because that's the nature of hand sewing and I'm just going to continue that all the way around before I finish that though, I want to talk a little bit about stretching materials because we have about 20 minutes left of our live here and I want to make sure that you have information on that. Any questions on this, on this section? Bear with me one moment. I just want to make sure I'm getting the newest comments here. Okay, that's how I go about that. So I want to show you, and we talked about this, but I just want to show it to you again real quick. So these jeans that I'm stitching for my friend, they have a great deal of stretch, right? You can see it, they have a great deal of stretch. So the patches that I use for them like the one that I did here. No, I'll bring that back up. They need to stretch as well. <laughs> there we go. They need to stretch as well so that when she's moving and this moves around her body, it moves with it. If it doesn't, if your patch doesn't stretch and your stitches don't stretch, the garment is likely to rip out again really quickly because it doesn't have anywhere to move and it wants to move. So there are two things to see here. One is this cross stitch right here, that's a stretchy stitch, which means that it will move when you pull on it. I'm gonna show you up here. That is it. This stitch here is a running stitch that we've been doing on our patching here. It will not stretch. And so you need to really only use this, not like I did here, but only use it vertically, not horizontally. I showed it here so you can see that this part of the patch doesn't stretch. You see that? And that isn't going to ultimately work out. So those need to come back out. But I wanted to show it to you as an example. Um, the cross stitch, though, does. So generally speaking, any stitch that has a back and forth motion is going to stretch because the thread is going this way and that way and this way and that way. And when you pull the thread out, it moves. It has an ability to move out and in. Whereas in the running stitch, it's just back and forth and it has no ability to stretch whatsoever. 
So I'm going to show you really quick on my scrap here how to do a stretchy stitch. And we'll just do an easy cross stitch because that's a simple one to get going on. So let me show you that now. So I have my thread. Let me check comments real quick. Bear with me. So I have my thread, I'm going to give myself again that knot just because I want you to see that. And when I get done with this stitch that I'm going to show you, I'll show you again how to knot off on the back if you didn't get a chance to see that. So a cross stitch, and I'll do a really big one, you would not do it this big, but I want you to be able to see it really well, is a stitch that comes up from the bottom, it goes over at a diagonal, so I'm going to go over about 45 degrees, and back down. And again, this is a huge stitch that I'm showing you on this. This is not what you would use. You would not want it to be this big on your garment because it would catch on everything. But I want you to really be able to see it. So I'm going to do that. Then on the inside, I'm going to go back to where this was and come back out. So that's where my knot was. That's where I came up through the fabric originally. And I come through. So see, I'm, I'm right along that vertical line there. And then I'm going to go back down here. There are a couple of ways to do a cross stitch. This is just the one that I want to show you. So there's a cross stitch. And you can see that it, I'm not doing it on fabric that stretches. <laughs> I'll change it so that I am. But it stretches because it has a back and forth motion and it's allowing the fabric to move with it. So let me do it going this direction because my fabric wants to stretch this way. So I'll do it that way. So here I am. I'm going to go over and I'm going to show you rather than stab, I'm actually going to just move my needle through to where I want it to come up. And then there's that. And then I could come here and I could go over to this one. And then I would come back down here and over to this one. And you can just kind of think of it as this grid, right? And then back here and over to this one. And then I would have my two cross stitches right here. And when I pull them this way, you see how they move with the fabric? They have a little bit of give to them. You can see that. There we go. There we go. There's a little bit of give to them. That's what you want. And it has that because it's got this back and forth motion as you're stitching. So when you stitch, you want your stitches to have an angle to them. And that could be just a parallel stitch. And a parallel stitch would be something like this. Ha, just kidding. This will happen to you too, I'm guessing, is you'll forget which side of the fabric you're on and you'll go down on the wrong side. Now that I've been using this thread, it's really quite fluffy, so it's hard to re-thread that needle with that fluffy end. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to, again, pinch it between my fingers really tightly, really tightly, come through, wiggle my needle over it, trap the needle with my finger, and pull it through. Okay, so if I were going to just do a parallel stitch, I would go into the fabric where I want it to end and back up where I want it to begin. So here, and then I would come over here. I don't have my lines anywhere, so this would be a little bit more wonky in there. So like this, again, way larger than what you would want is a parallel stitch. See how these are on the same line and these are on the same line. So now I come over, I go into the fabric where I want it to end and up where I want the next one to begin. And then I pull it through. And then the same thing. I come down where I want it to end and in and up through the fabric where I want it to begin. And that, a little wonky, would be a parallel stitch. So both the parallel stitch and the cross stitch will stretch. 
So those are great ones to start with when you're mending something stretchy. I want to show you. Hold on one moment. Okay, so we're showing, I'm showing you mending on basically just woven garments, which means it's made with a fabric like denim or like a shirting that is woven in a back and forth motion. If you're going to try to mend something that is a knit garment, so like a t-shirt, you can certainly do that. But that really has to have a stretchy stitch on it if it's going to be anywhere that the garment's gonna move. This patch that I did on this dress is down near the hem. So it doesn't need to move, although it does a little bit because these are kind of, uh, they end up being sort of a parallel stitch when I did these little running stitches. But this would probably not work if it were someplace like up on the bust or up on the chest area where your, your shirt is stretching over your body and isn't like at the hem where it can just hang loose. But you can mend your t-shirt. You just need to be mindful that you're using another t-shirt material as your, as your patch, and there's my patch on the inside. And you wanna be mindful that you're using stitches that stretch. So for the, our purposes here today, that was a cross stitch and a parallel stitch. There are several other ones too that you can find when you um, look online. If you were to Google hand stitches that stretch, you probably would find what you needed. But that's how you might finish or how you might mend a hole and say, a dress or a t-shirt that is at the hem and therefore doesn't need to move over your body like it would at the a pair of leggings you probably would not want to mend this way they would not have enough stretch to go over your body the way you need it to okay here i am back any questions so far on mending Anybody um, have any other stories that they want to share? I'm awfully grateful that you're all here today. It's been really fun so far. Um, I'm going to show you real quick how I might add in some fun running stitches on the patch that I first began. And I'm going to show you one of my favorite books for mending if you like to have resources. Although in that PDF, that there's a link to in the comments um, and again that's my visible mending little PDF that tells you how to get started what materials you need um, how to create this little pouch that we're creating the exterior for and also other resources that I like so why don't I show you the book first since we're here mending life is one of my favorites and it really speaks to, right, it's got a little philosophical aspect to it, to it, right, as well. It speaks to the idea that mending our clothing is sort of like just tending our lives, right? So if we take our clothing from a sustainability aspect and we mend them, it means our life is longer. It means they're going to be a longer time before they're in the, in the trash and rotting away in some trash place that I can't think of the name of. <laughs> it, it's fun. Anyway, it extends the life of your clothing. It makes them more and more sustainable. And that's really a beautiful thing. And it's, I know a lot of us here are, are concerned with sustainability and want to not be part of what we call the fast fashion mm, movement, if you will. That is how most of the world operates right now. We want to be part of a slower fashion mindset. We are part of a slower fashion mindset. And the slower fashion mindset is really talking about how can we A, prolong the life of the clothing that we have, B, find things that are used, or maybe make them ourselves, or purchase things that are really great quality that will last longer. And so mending is a big part of that ability to reuse what you have. And I also think that when you add in your own visible mending stitches, it adds just 
a little more uniqueness and a little more style to what you're doing, right? Like these are much more fun really than they were before I did the visible undo. And I think that if we can embrace our scars and if we can embrace our um, holes, whatever it might be, that we are working on mending, and I'm not just talking about clothing, right? I'm talking about us as humans. If we can embrace those men's, then we're more beautiful, truly, than we were before we had those things that we are working on mending. And I think that's really part of the larger beauty of having visible mending as part of your creative endeavors. So this book is a great one. Let me go back to that. To go into so is a book called mending matters and again they have a lot of philosophical conversation in them as well but they'll talk about the basics of like darning and mending like what we have talked about here today but also maybe a simple mend like say you have a seam that has broken out you can easily just use this running stitch right on a seam to repair a seam and again if it's a stretchy material you have to use a stretchy stitch and you can just use a cross stitch or a parallel stitch on a seam, any place that you have a garment that is breaking out as well. So know that you can do that. All right. Okay. So how I might begin with this guy here, I didn't finish this obviously, because I didn't want you all to sit there and watch me finishing it for all of eternity. Um, checking my comments here just for a minute. Bear with me a moment. So how I might begin with this guy here. I didn't finish this episode. Brad. Thanks. He filled he filled in the word I was struggling with, which was landfill. <laughs> I appreciate that. I'm not sure why this is happening on my two devices that I have up, but my comments are lagging way behind and so I'm not able to see them, which I'm really sorry about that because I love the conversation and I love talking to you. Um, but the question that Brad brought up was can you talk about tolerances and matching fabric? And so to, to mention that again, is you want your fabrics, again, to have the same kind of weight to them. You want, if you're going to patch denim, using denim to patch denim is a great idea, but also using something that is, using something that is of the same thickness is a good idea. Using something that is made of the same kind of material is also a great idea. Like you don't necessarily want a polyester patch with a cotton garment because they're going to wear and degrade at a very different rate. Polyester might not be a surprise to you, but polyester is made out of plastic in essence, and it's going to last a very, very, very long time. And it's very strong as opposed to cotton, which is a very obviously natural material and is going to biodegrade and is going to wear down at a faster rate than polyester will. So you want your patches to match. If one, if your garment is stretchy, you want your patch to be stretchy. If your garment is very thin, you want a very thin patch. And again, matching the content, like whether it's cotton or linen or polyester or wool, whatever it is, matching the content of the patch and the fabric is a great way to go as well. Let me see. Any other questions, throw them over there. And again, there are links in the comments that you can donate to both Crosshatch and Title Track if you're just joining us, because they've been offering such lovely programming for a good long time now, and it's gonna continue for several more weeks, I believe. <laughs> so please donate to their causes. And there's also a link to the PDF that explains what I'm doing here today, the visible mending, um, in that comment as well. All right, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna bring the camera back down to my patch. All right, I'm not sure how many times one person can say all right, but here I am. 
So I've decided I want to do some running stitches that run like maybe three of them parallel here and then maybe two more on this side. That's how I want to jazz up this patch. And again, I don't need those for this patch. This patch is completely secure once I finish this parallel stitch all the way around by being secured around the edges and secured around the hole. But I want to add a little bit of style, a little bit of pizzazz to it, right? So I'm going to take my, my ruler and I'm going to decide that I want it to be about maybe a quarter of an inch. I'm going to give myself a, a line there and a line here to start with. And I'm probably not going to do any more of my lines because my tailor's chalk will wear off and that's not really what I want to happen. So I have my thread. It's been double knotted. And I'm just going to come up here wherever it feels pleasing to me. And I'm going to come up through my fabric. And I'm going to come over here. And I'm going to go down. And I'm going to build my stitches up on my needle and then pull it through. And I like to then grab back here and pull it through so that it's nice and taut. And then I'm going to keep going through. And then, and you might want, right, to line up your stitches so they match with the ones over here. That might feel like a really good, beautiful aesthetic to you, or you might not at all. Like you get to choose. This is your own, this is your own adventure. You choose how you want it to be. So I'm building up my stitches again. I'm going to go all the way through, pull out my needle, and continue on. And I might do, say, one more. And I'm going to show you again how I knot off because it's kind of confusing, but once you get the hang of it, it's really handy. So here I am. I'm taking this, putting a little bit of tension on the thread as it comes out of the fabric with this hand. So this hand has a little tension on that thread. You can see me moving it. Take my needle and I go under creating a loop and I pull this through and then when the time is right, when I'm getting too short to hang on to this anymore, I put my finger on it and I pull it through and that gives me this little knot that lands right on the top of the fabric, which is a great place for it to be. And I like to double knot it, so I'm going to do it again. I'm going to put my tension in, I'm going to pull it through, I've gone under the thread with my needle, put my finger on it, and pull it through again. And there I have a double knot that's nice and tight. Now, you wouldn't have necessarily needed to knot that off. You could have just jumped over to your next line and done what you wanted to do over there, as long as it wasn't too big of a jump. So I'm going to do my next line right here. And again, I'm going to build my stitches up on my needle. And I'm going to try to mimic the stitches I already have because I want that to feel like it's more or less the same as it's going. And come down and over. And again, as we're doing this, if anybody has any questions, I'd love to answer any questions you might have. If you're new and you're just joining us, we're doing some visible mending, which is all about mending your clothing in a way that adds beautiful stitches to them, extends their life, and keeps them out of the landfill that much longer, gives you something meditative and beautiful to do and creative, and gives your clothing some beauty and unique soul, if you will. So here I am, I'm coming through, and I'm going to come down right there. So that's what I've done on this one, and then again, I'm going to knot it. I'll show you again. I've got tension, I come under with my needle, making a loop, put my finger on it, and pull it through. Put my tension on, I come under, put my finger on it, and pull it through. And then now I'm going to cut that off. You know, this happens to me all the time when I'm sewing, like, on the couch <laughs> where I lose my materials, but, like, I'm working on this big of a surface. How do I lose my scissors? I found them. <laughs> You're always going to get the real story with me. Okay. And so that's how I've done this part of my 
It is one And again, this would not be here. I would have finished this all the way around, but I didn't want to have you all wait for that necessarily. And now I'm going to do a couple this way just to give myself a little more interest in my patch here. And again, I'm using Sasha Co thread, which is 100% cotton thread, and it's used for traditional Japanese Sasha Co stitches. I'm going to do one below it too. And it comes in this little skein like this. And I showed it earlier, and if you want to see the, the replay, you can sign up for it on my website um, through the link in the comments. But I showed earlier how to braid it into a loose braid so that you can pull your threads out, and I'm going to show you here. And then just to let you know too, if you're just joining us, this skein I dyed with onion skins, which is very fun, and it creates this really beautiful golden color. So I pulled it right through the loop. And now I have my thread and I'm going to thread my needle and as I go here. What do you all have planned for after after we get done with this riveting live? Anybody have any fun plans for the day? all right Brad just put a comment if you didn't see it that next week is decolonizing our thought life facilitated discussion with I'm going to butcher this and I'm very sorry Leora Lancaster I'm not going to speak her um her native name because I unfortunately would butcher it but that sounds like a really lovely a really lovely thing to be part of and again you can see some links in the comments to support both crosshatch and title track and if you want the PDF that I keep mentioning on visible mending you can see the link for that too and you can just sign up and you'll get that link emailed to you and then you can also get the replay if I'm able to save the replay in case you want to be entertained at a different time okay so I've knotted my thread I threaded my needle and now I'm going to begin just like I did previously and I think I'm going to you know, this is all that design aesthetic, right? You get to choose, again, you get to choose your adventure here, how you want this to look. There's something very appealing about these little running stitches on your garment. I bet you will find yourself petting your legs or, you know, sort of joyfully caressing your elbow, <laughs> wherever your patch might be. I find that it's hard for me to keep my hands up it because it just feels tactile in a tactile way it feels really good all right so i'm going to go past my patch here and again i'm just sort of manhandling this through this thread is actually a little easier to pull through if you see that it's not gliding super smoothly. There are a couple things that you could do. One is I could spend more time putting my hand oils into it, which is what we did when we loved up our thread. Two, you could run it through a little bit of beeswax to give it a little bit of a more smooth texture to, so it will glide more easily through your fabric. Um, three, I think that because I have dyed this fabric, it actually fluffed it up a little bit in the dye bath and so it actually is a little less smooth than it might have been had I not dyed it but I love its color so I'm okay with it and so I want to here I am and I want to skip down to this line and I don't necessarily want to put a knot in it right because I'm trying to be efficient so I'm actually going to come up and I'm going to add a stitch to this line because I think aesthetically that would be more pleasing so I'm going to kind of skip my way over rather than go all the way from here to here that would be too far it would catch and it would be um, annoying and you know we certainly don't want anything annoying so i'm going to go down and i'm going to show you how i would come over to where i want it to be i'm actually going to come over here so i go 
through the fabric where I want it to end and I poke my needle through where I want it to come back up. And then I'm able to do my stitches here. It looks great. I have a knot, which of course you're all gonna have. The way that you do that, you just pull it back out and give it a tug and usually that will come right out. Stop what you're doing, pull it back out and give it a little tug. And then go back through. Does anybody have any garment in mind that they're like, oh, I know what I'm going to mend next. If they don't have it in hand right now, do you have anything in mind that you want to mend? Okay. So this is probably about finished for me. I would obviously finish this hole and maybe I'll do that real quick here while we're still on. Um, and then I would be done with this portion of my pouch. And again, my PDF will show you, I keep referring to this pouch, and if you're just joining us, the PDF shows you how to make the pouch, which is just this little pouch here. And it's completely hand sewn. And the reason I do this as a project is because I like to be able to have students practice mending and also be able to have this beautiful little thing of utility that they can use. So if I were all finished, I'm not quite as you know, but if I were, I would then take my lining fabric and I would lay it with the right sides together. And this doesn't matter if these are the same kind of fabric because now we're making an object. We're not mending clothing, right? So everything that we've talked about when we want our, our fabric and our threads to match with what we're doing is all about the wear of our clothing but this is a little project so it's fine this is a linen kind of a thin linen and this is a denim so they are not the same weight but i would put them together right sides together and i would put a pin on either side to leave yourself a little two inch gap and i would do a running stitch all the way around leaving this open and then when you've done that you'll turn it inside out so imagine i've done that imagine it's stitched and i've turned it inside out Right, so it would be something like this. Then I would stitch that little bit closed, bring my pouch up, and imagining this would all be very clean because you would have turned it inside out after stitching it, and you would stitch around this edge. And you could do a little top stitching here if you wanted to, not closed obviously, because that's your pouch, that's where you put things. I should say to you, I missed something. So before you actually stitch them together, you would put a little jersey pull in there. And again, this is all in that PDF. If you decide you wanna grab it, it's in the comments and the link for Kinship Handwork. And you would put it right in here before you started so that it would be poking out like this. And then when you have, this would be all sewn, once you bring it down, you could put a button here to keep it closed. And that would be your little pouch with a cute little catch on one side. Folks, I have had, I've had a really great time spending the last hour and a half with you talking about visible mending, which is something that I'm passionate about along with making clothing in general. I'm really grateful that you've been here. Um, I love it. If you have any questions to ask me your questions here, I've got a couple of minutes to talk about them if you have any. Let me get back to my, bear with me while I get back to the live so we can see it. Sorry, bear with me while I get back to the live so I can see the comments that you might be asking. But let me know if you have anything that comes up for you, anything that you would like to see. All right. Well, I am really grateful. I can't seem to get back to the comments. I'm really sorry about that. If you ask me any questions, I will pop on after I go off of the live and I'll answer any questions that you might have because that will feel really great to me to be able to do that. 
but I'm so grateful that you spent the time with me. Again, I'm Tina, and I have a business called Kinship Handwork in Northern Michigan, where I show people how to make and sew garments that they love. And part of that is also the handwork of visible mending, natural dyeing, and black printing, things like that. I've been so grateful, and I'm really, really grateful to Crafts Hatch and Title Track for having me and then giving me the opportunity to meet with all of you and spend my Saturday morning with you. If you want to get a copy of the PDF, if you want to be able to get any of the replays that I might be able to pull off of Facebook, jump on the link for the Kinship Handwork link that Brad put on the comments and let me know. And then also be sure to donate to Crafts Hatch and Title Track because they're doing such lovely things in the world and I am really grateful again to have the opportunity to have this community and be part of it. So thank you and have a lovely Saturday.